Good morning and welcome to Bioconference, uh, Life Sciences Conference 2012. Uh, my name is Catherine Borden. I'm a professor at the University of Montreal. And today I'm going to be speaking about um, um, one of my favorite oncogenes, the eukaryotic initiation factor 4E. But before I get started, the uh, organizers asked me to make two announcements. The first is um, that as your questions come to mind, please submit your questions so that while I'm um, speaking, so that I can address them all at the end of the presentation without having a, a delay in waiting for questions. If I can address something while I'm talking, I will, um, but we'll see how that goes. The second uh, message is that attendees can earn free CE credits accredited by the ASCLS PACE process. You can click on the bioconferencelive.com website homepage and click on the CE credit link to find a listing of, of my presentation. Click on that link and you will be connected to an ASCLS website where the presentation can be evaluated and you will receive your credit, uh, CE credit and a certificate. So now to um, get on to the presentation. So today I'm going to talk about the eukaryotic initiation factor EIF4E, um, which I'm going to just nickname 4E um, e throughout the talk. My talk is divided roughly into two parts. First, aside from giving you an introduction into this oncogene, um, and explaining its overall relevance to cancer, I'm also um, going to explain some uh, molecular bio biological mechanisms of how 4E can oncogenically transform cells, and then the rest of the talk will be devoted to our, our finding that EIF4E can be targeted in the clinic, so giving you some background on that and also showing you at the end our clinical data. So, first of all, would like to just explain to you um, why anyone would be interested in studying or targeting EIF4E. Well, first of all, its overexpression can lead to transformation in cell culture and animal models and rescue cells from a wide variety of apoptotic stimuli. In fact, 4E is elevated in, in an estimated 30% of cancers and its overexpression is normally linked to poor prognosis. 4E overexpressing cells um, appear to develop an oncogene dependency or addiction, and so this provides us with a therapeutic window. And down here is just a little blur, but for anybody who's perhaps not familiar with the idea of oncogene addiction. But what in essence it means is that the cells that are overexpressing 4E grow more dependent on them, and thus targeting 4E in these cells, is, these cells are uh, more responsive to targeting of 4E than normal cells, and obviously this is clinically relevant um, as you'll see later on. So this is just a very brief list of the cancers that 4E is known to be elevated in. And I'd just like to state that in some cancers, such as head and neck cancers, EIF4 elevation is being associated with, with above 98% of these cancers. Um, in other cancers, such as acute myeloid leukemia, 4E overexpression is only um, known to be elevated in the M4 and M5 subtypes, and this is a subtype that we'll be discussing at length later. And in other cancers, for instance, breast cancer, 4 is elevated in approximately 50%. So we have quite a wide variety of the presence of 4 contributing mainly or partly to certain subsets of, 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 of these cancers as well as many others. So 4 is upregulated in all of these cancers, and so how does 4 become elevated? And I don't really have time to talk about it in detail today, but just to give you some ideas, 4 is actually elevated at multiple levels. So its RNA stability can be um, increased by HUR, um, which is an RNA stability factor, and we see this in head and neck cancers, for instance. Um, in breast cancers and also head and neck cancers, 4 elevation has been associated with gene amplification. And finally, um, we have evidence that the transcription of 4 is also increased. And in some cancers, we have evidence that multiple events can be happening at the same time, all leading to the eventual elevation of 4E. And I should say, for instance, in M4 and M5 subtypes of cancer, that we see um, upwards of, of 3 to 8, even up to 10-fold elevation in the patient. So elevation is quite substantial. So to the next slide, I'll just show you what does 4E do. And so 4E function I've divided in this slide to being in the cytoplasmic or nuclear um, um, compartments. 
And in the cytoplasm, 4E function is extremely well defined. Most of you will, will be very, very familiar with 4E's critical and essential role in uh, translation of mRNA into protein, which is obviously a critical step in gene expression. And so we'll just go through the cytoplasmic side first to give you a, sort of a molecular understanding of how these things are working. Here, this is a crystal structure originally solved by um, uh, Steve Burley's lab and Marco Trigiano paper in the 90s, where you see the 4E protein binding a critical um, factor for this talk and for 4E function, which is the methyl 7 guanosine cat moiety, which is found on the 5' end of all nuclear encoded mRNA. And it's this moiety that is how 4E can recognize RNAs and a variety through, through its this is through its cat, what we call the cat binding pocket because we nicknamed the methyl 7 guanosine cap or cap as um, for, for this. And on the dorsal surface of 4E shown here, much of the translation machinery such as 4G and the poly binding protein, et cetera, will bind um, to engage, allow the eventual engagement of the ribosome and, and translation initiation. Now it turns out that 4E overexpression does not elevate the uh, expression of all transcripts equally well. For instance, um, RNAs would have complex 5' UTRs, which t typically are very long and GC rich, are much more sensitive to the levels of 4E. For instance, many years ago now, people overexpress 4E in cells and look at 35S in the thionine incorporation and do not see global increases in translation, but rather specific targets seem to be much more sensitive to its elevation. And for instance, some of these would include ornithine decarboxylase, vascular endothelial growth factor, and many other proteins. And these proteins tend to be involved in proliferation and apoptotic rescue, thus contributing to the oncogenic, trans, uh, oncogenic transformation activities of 4E. Because as we know from animal models, overexpression of 4E um, leads to a wide variety of histologically distinct cancers as well as Fourier overexpression leading to, to transformation in, in cell type, as I uh, said at the very beginning of this talk. Now, the Fourier cytoplasmic function is extremely well understood. It has a set of, of inhibitors and also positive regulators. And um, we were also very curious, though, about the substantial portion of nuclear 4E, where in some cells up to 68% of 4E can be nuclear. And um, as I'll show you later on, the, the, the localization of 4E can be quite context dependent. Now in nuclear 4E, um, we can see that again, you must find this, this 5 prime cap on the RNA in, or, in order for RNAs to be preferentially exported from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. And this allows their increased availability to the translation machinery without necessarily increasing their translational efficiency, which is what we define here as increased translation, is increased polysomal loading, whereas here we, we define the, the effect on gene expression as an increase in the, the target transcript, transcript localization in the cytoplasm, permitting increased engagement of, of the polysome. So again, there's nuclear-specific factors that can inhibit this, uh, such as uh, PML ring. And um, the RNAs that are being transported in this way require not only a 5' methyl guanosine cap, but also a specific approximately 50 nucleotide element we call the EIF4E sensitivity element, or 4Z for short. And RNAs which contain the secondary structure element shown here have their RNA export promoted um, upon 4E overexpression. In, flat, in fact, the addition of 4Z to LACZ and other chimeric report, reporters allows the increased export of these RNAs to the cytoplasm. These RNAs, approximately 700 um, to date is our estimation, include many cyclins, such as cyclin D1, and also targets such as ODC, which are also targets of the translation machinery. VEGF, for instance, is only a target of the translation machinery and not an export target. So we can have differential effects on gene expression depending whether or not um, the 4E is mainly nuclear or mainly cytoplasmic or equally distributed. But together, these functions clearly drive proliferation and apoptotic rescue um, so at the cell biological level, which can ultimately contribute to oncogenic transformation. And I should say that many of the genes, as I said already, were involved in proliferation. And so 4E coordinately regulates transcripts involved in the same biochemical pathways 
And as I said before, we have to remember this for later on in the talk, that this is all reliant on cap binding activity, which allows us um, something to target. For, um, for the next slide is showing you um, just evidence that 4E can actually regulate the, um, the RNA export process. And also, the very important finding in terms of understanding RNA export of specific RNAs from the nucleus is that 4E only associates with a subset of RNAs in the nucleus. And this is completely different to the cytoplasm, where 4E interacts with all RNAs observed. So what you're seeing here is either uh, IP of EIF4E or the IgG control, looking at cyclin D1 or GAF-DH um, RNAs. So we're looking at transcript IP. And if we just do an IP, we see a substantial enrichment of cyclin D1 relative to GAP-DH. If we compete for the CAP, uh, with the CAP, we can compete off this interaction, showing it's CAP-dependent. But if we use guanosine as our negative control, which can't bind 4E, it can't compete off. And clearly, our, our control IPs look good. Now, if we do 4E over expression and look at the export of cyclin D1 RNA, where we fractionate the cells into the cytoplasmic and the nuclear fractions and analyze the RNA content um, of each fraction using quantitative real-time PCR, again, you can see that overexpression of 4E leads to elevation of the export of this transcript, um, whereas other transcripts which we publish extensively, shown here, um, like GAP-DH are not affected, so this is specific. And if we mutate the CAP binding site so 4E can't associate with RNA, we kill this activity. Now, if we, we can also do the converse experiment and do um, SI RNA. And what you're looking at here, instead of looking at the cytoplasmic to nuclear ratio, here we're looking at the nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. So here we're looking at nuclear retention of cyclin D1 transcripts. And if we SI4E, we have increased nuclear retention of these transcripts. And if we use control unrelated SI RNAs or scrambled RNAs, we don't have this effect. So globally, 4E binds specific RNAs in the nucleus and promotes their export. So is this clinically relevant? Of course, you're going to ask me. And here, we, I'm going to show you some data that um, indicates this is. Now, our, our particular interest is in M4M5 AML and also, to a lesser extent, blast crisis DML, and the results on this slide will reflect both of these populations. So if we isolate either CD34 positive cells from a normal individual, so these are primitive progenitor cells, or the same leukemic blast cells from an M4 AML patient, you can see that 4E is clearly highly elevated, but it's also now jam-packed into the nucleus. Just to confirm that the protein levels are elevated, you can see here healthy volunteers relative to the normal patients, um, and relative to the AML or blast crisis CML patients. And if we look at cyclin D1 as a downstream effector of RNA export, you can see that this is also elevated, or downstream target, I should have said. Now, what we can also see is that total levels of cyclin D1 RNA are not affected. Um, so this is a post, in this case, um, cyclin D1 is not being elevated transcriptionally. In other leukemias, it may well be the case, but here we don't see that. So we fractionated ourselves, and I should say this is a northern blot, as this is last panel here. And as, if we fractionate the cells into nuclear and cytoplasmic fractions, we can see that in the AML patients, or the blast crisis CML patient, that we have substantial elevation of export relative to the healthy volunteer, no change in gap dh tRNA lysine serves as our fractionation, one of our fractionation controls where we've also published many others. Here, I've only shown you a, very, a, a small handful of patient specimens, but we've analyzed over 100 AML specimens to date, and this is the phenotype we've seen in every single M4 or M5 specimen that we've seen. This also indicates this increased nuclear export that the, this highly enriched, jam-packed 4E nuclear phenotype in the AML M4 subtypes is biologically relevant, i.e., these cells are actively exporting their RNAs and they're doing it more so than the healthy volunteers. 
So the obvious question is, how does Fourier-dependent RNA export work? Because clearly we have already a very detailed understanding of how RNA translation works in terms of Fourier's role in translation initiation. Um, and how does it contribute to oncogenesis? Because as I will show you, it does contribute to oncogenesis um, relevant not only to M4 and 5 AML. So in, a, in recent studies that we've done, we simply asked the question, how is 4E um, causing the promotion of, of a RNA export? What are the actual mechanics that underlie this? And it turns out um, that this relies very much on modifications 4E can make to the nuclear pore complex, or MPC. What we already knew previously and published, um, published in 2009 is that 4E with the 4Z RNA um, that we've shown here, so the subsets of RNAs containing that special 3' UTR element, specifically interact with something called the leucine-rich protein, and CRIM1, which is, which is a nuclear export receptor, allows docking onto the nuclear pore and permits export. But understanding the composition of the nuclear pore doesn't a priori help us understand why Fourier overexpression actually elevates this process. And so here you can see many of the nuclear pore complexes are detailed, and we're not going to worry about the specific details of this, except with regard to a handful of proteins. So the nuclear pore is made up of a nuclear basket, the central channel by which the molecules can pass through to the cytoplasm, and then the cytoplasmic fibrils, which are very important to the story I'm telling you today. And cytoplasmic fibrils are thought to be a site where, where cargoes, RNA-containing or protein-containing cargoes, can bind to, to the main constituent of the fibrils, known as RAMPP2, or also known as NUP358, nuclear porn 358. And through GTPase activity of RAMPP2 allows release of the cargoes, allowing recycling of the export factors and the freedom of the cargo to go to wherever it needs to go in the cell to act, in this case, the RNA to the translation machinery. So our studies actually show quite strikingly these are all Western blots, that if we overexpress 4E relative to vector, that we substantially reduce the levels of the RAMPP2 protein. And as I said, RAMPP2 is a major constituent of, of cytoplasmic fibrils, and so we're likely changing the overall structure of the nuclear pore by 4E overexpression. We note that other factors here um, are not changing their protein levels, um, and so this is not a global effect on the nuclear pore, but rather a specific effect seems to be targeted in order for 4E to, um, to promote export and, and, as you'll see later, to actually um, aid in promoting the oncogenic transformation that we see. We also have some positive controls here where you see cyclin D1 cemic um, are, are already established 4E targets, so 4E overexpression elevates them as, as it does MBS1. Um, and we also found that other cargo release factors for RNA um, export, GLI-1 and DDX9, are also elevated by 4E. And finally, what's, what's very comforting and interesting to us is the elevation of this factor, RAMBP1. RAMBP1 is the other major protein that helps the release of these, um, of these factors, um, but it's soluble. RAMPP2 is 358 kilodalton protein that makes the cytoplasmic fibril. RAMPP1 is a 23 um, kilodalton protein that, that is soluble and we think, as you'll see later, is actually speeding up cargo release and recycling of components. And this is how Fourier overexpression promotes the um, export of its RNAs. Now, we overexpress here, but in this column here, we use SI4E, and we get the expected converse effect, where we highly elevate RANBP2, as you can see here. Um, and also, as you can see, the positive targets of 4E, DDX19, GLI-1, and RANBP2, are all down-regulated, down um, consistent with what their upregulation upon overexpression. And finally, if we use a pharmacological inhibitor of 4E called ribavirin, which is a competitive inhibitor of the CAP, and I'll discuss at length later, we, we also see um, the expected decrease in our positive targets, but also an increase in RAMBP2. So things that inhibit 4E um, transform, mediated transformation seem to elevate RAMBP2, and 4E seems to want to lower RAMBP2 and thus reduce the, the cytoplasmic fibrils in order to promote both its export and, as you'll see, transformation activities. 
So, well, the obvious experiment to see if this was a functionally important observation, because all I showed you was a uh, was uh, protein over you know protein expression change, was to overexpress RAMBP2. Um, RAMBP2 being 358 kilodaltons cannot really be overexpressed by itself, but we took the zinc finger regions of RAMBP2, which are known to bind CRIM1 and be important for our export um, activity. And you can see here if we look at bulk of LACZ, which is not sensitive to 4E levels, or uh, LACZ4Z, which is now an export target of 4E, overexpression of RAMBP2 zinc finger fingers causes a reduction in, in the um, levels of LACZ. And consistently, if we look at the RNA export, we see here that in vectors with high 4E, we have increased export of LACZ4Z, as we'd expect. And when we overexpress RAMBP2, we knock that down substantially. And if we look at an, an endogenous RNA, CMIC, we can see that overexpression of the, the zinc finger here or here of RAMBP2 suppresses endogenous RNA export targets as well. LACZ by itself, total RNA is unaffected. And also ubiquitin, a not an RNA export target, does not is not affected by any of the things that we've done. So this is specific. Um, also you note that LACZ not being sensitive to 4E is not particularly sensitive to overexpression of, of RAMBP2 as well. I don't have time to show you, but we rec recently published that if we use another construct generated from RAMBP2, which cannot bind CRIM1 and does not contain these zinc fingers, there's no effect on 4 um, dependent RNA export. So this is specific to this region of RAMBP2. Now, does this have anything to do with oncogenic transformation? And that's a very good question. So RAMBP2, we can see here. Um, we use a foci formation assay, so we're looking at the loss of contact inhibition and fibroblasts. And as you, if you have either overexpression of 4E or of 4E plus RAMBP2 uh, zinc fingers, you can see we have a substantial reduction in foci number upon uh, uh, overexpression of the zinc fingers, really supporting our idea that, that this RNA export activity is contributing to the oncogenic transformation. Looking at a wide variety of endogenous RNA targets and um, overexpressing 4E or mutant forms of 4E to establish that, that we can make a link between transformation RNA export and, and the functionality of this. So we looked at two mutants in particular. We looked at the W73A, which is active in exports but not in translation. We've published that previously. And another mutant which is active in translation um, but not export S53A. As you'll see here, we determined we started these studies only knowing that this was deficient. Um, in, this, this was sufficient, good at translation. And you can see here that in all of the 40 sensitive RNAs we look at, the S53A mutation is completely unable um, to to promote the export of known targets or the recently identified targets we see here. And furthermore, S53A. Um, does, does not cause suppression of RAMBP2 as seen by 4E or the export competent mutant W73A. So we can make the link here that, that the ability to export is linked to the ability to modulate RAMBP2 levels. And furthermore, I don't have time to show you, but as published in this recent paper, we can actually see when we do RNA immunoprecipitations that while we clearly have for E um, immunoprecipitating specific RNAs in the nucleus, as I showed you earlier on in the talk, that um, S53A has no RNA binding activity in the nucleus. However, NMR studies show that the S53A mutant is still totally active in cap binding, and cytoplasmic RNA immunoprecipitation show that S53A works as well as wild type for RNA immunoprecipitation. So clearly, the S53A mutant uh, represents a, a key tool that we can use to try to understand what factors in the nucleus 4 e must bind in order to make these specific RNPs. Now, how is this relevant to the oncogenic potential of 4E? Well, using the same Anchorage-dependent um, foci formation assay, so looking at the loss of contact inhibition, 
Here, where you have more blue, clearly you have lots of oncogenic transformation. And you can see our point mutation, S53A, completely abrogates this. And so this really strongly suggests that the S53A mutant um, is, um, is going to be key. It, this mutant, as again, as I said, is deficient in export, but previous studies by several other labs have shown that S53A is active in translation, and yet it cannot transform cells, highlighting the relevance of this RNA export activity of 4E to transformation, at least in some context. So what's our summary model? Here you're seeing the nucleus and the cytoplasm under normal conditions or the conditions of Fourier overexpression. Here these dark purple lines are our RAMBP2 cytoplasmic fibrils. And what we can see is as our cargos go through, they, they can get stuck either sequestered on RAMBP2 and slower release, allow, slowing down their, their transport to the cytoplasm, and also potentially slowing down the recycling of important factors that are required for export. Under the Fourier overexpression condition shown on this side, what we can see is we actually have reduced cytoplasmic fibrils, as seen by reduced RAMBP2, and we actually have elevated RAMBP1 compensating for this, and the soluble factor somehow increases the rate of recycling and, and cargo release, thereby increasing this process. And obviously, as we said, the, these RAMBP2 fibrils seem to be playing a very important role in the oncogenic transformation potential of Fourier as well. So now that we've gone in depth about ribavir uh, about 4E and 4E's RNA export activity, it's going to be clinically relevant because we can see um, that this is elevated in patients, as I already showed you um, an example or two of earlier on. And given that all of the activities of 4E, the nuclear and cytoplasmic activities, both are dependent on the cap, um, 4E's cap binding activity. We were very much interested in seeking out ways that we could inhibit this activity, potentially use this oncogene addiction to, to target um, cancer cells with overexpression 4E and sparing normal cells, and um, potentially giving clinical benefit. So let me just summarize these slides here. So I'm going to summarize uh, the data we found to date in a series of, of papers listed here. Um, and then I'll show you some of the supporting data as well as, um, as, as the clinical trial data that we have out of uh, radiofer monotherapy and uh, combination therapies in, in AML patients. So today I'm going to show you evidence that radiofer directly binds 4E, that it binds 4E in or overlapping with the cap binding site. We know that radiofer inhibits 4E activity in tissue culture. You already saw some evidence of that when we compared our SI4E to ribavirin experiments in the RAMPP2 uh, data that you saw. Ribavirin and 4E complexes are found in live cells. Um, ribavirin inhibits 4E activity in patients and also in primary specimens. And what I don't have time to talk to you about today, but I would just like to note now, is that the loss of ribavirin 4E interactions in, cancer in, in our patient cancer cells correlates with, with clinical resistance. So this is one of the um, evidences that ribavirin directly binds 4E. We simply mixed ribavirin with, uh, with guanosine, or in this case guanosine triphosphate is a negative control. Guanosine triphosphate is known not to bind 4E. Um, and we could see by mass spec, here's the raw data, here's the process data, that when we mix these three components, we see APL 4E. We see ribavirin 4E complexes and we don't see any of the nonspecific complex, strongly suggesting, at least here in vitro under these conditions, that we are forming specific ribavirin 4E complexes. We also extended these studies. Um, I'll go a bit more quickly through this because m m most of this section is, is, uh, is published, but rib uh, because 4E binds uh, the cap uh, intercalating between um, two, two tryptophan um, to tryptophan residues in terms of making sort of an aromatic sandwich, this causes uh, quenching, fluorescence quenching, and thus we have an we can monitor intrinsic fluorescence as a function of CAP, or in this case, ribavirin binding, um, and use that to monitor KDs using standard fluorescence um, techniques. Now, ribavirin's active metabolite in the cell is ribavirin triphosphate, RTP, so you're seeing data for both ribavirin and ribavirin triphosphate here. We can see that um, M7GTP binding and RTP, bi RTP binding curves are very similar, giving very similar KDs. 
Um, we expect that the RTP, because of the addition of the phosphates, has already been published for GTP, increases affinity quite substantially over just the ribavirin by itself. We also note that mutation of the CAT binding site here, in red, substantially impairs binding, whereas binding with 73A, shown here, doesn't substantially change the, the, um, the binding constant of W73A versus wild type for ribavirin, suggesting that it's using its CAT binding site for binding. Um, this, is, this data, I should say, was all done by um, Alex Kenses, and uh, this is just showing you some raw data of what you might expect to see. RTP is here in red, and 4E or G or 4E plus GTP is in green and blue. And so here in the raw data, here by Ivan Topasirovich, that we only see quenching by RTP but not GTP. Um, this is mouse 4E, this is human 4E. There are only four residues different, so we often use them interchangeably. So next bit of evidence that I'll show you, here is done by Alex Kensis, is using CAP chromatography. And here we have uh, the CAP attached to a solid support. We run 4E through, it attaches, it binds to the CAP as can seen by Western blot. And then we can add uh, CAP or RTP and see that we have very similar profiles of inhibition of, of binding as we increase. Um, a similar experiment done by Ivan Topasirovich shows that if we have 4E bound here to the CAP column, um, RTP, M7GDP, and M7GPPG, which are two different forms of the CAP, all three of these cause uh, elution from the, from the beads, whereas GTP um, and GPPG do not, again, suggesting a specific interaction of ribavirin um, and the CAP, but not our negative controls. And this is just some um, CD data where we can show that uh, addition of M7GTP and RTP cause changes in the secondary structure of Fourier upon binding, whereas GTP does not. And these changes seem to be similar in overall, um, in overall extent, causing minor changes, which is consistent. Previous studies already shown that the ca cap addition does not cause global changes to the Fourier structure. This is new um, NMR data that we have uh, a complex of 4E plus um, RTP, where you can see that um, in red is, is the addition of RTP and in black is APO, and you're just looking at an NMR spectra overlay. For those of you who are not familiar with NMR, each one of these peaks represents the NH um, amide proton of, of each amino acid, or in some cases, the indoles of the tryptophan. And the, the most important point here is that where red doesn't equal black means that the addition of RTP has caused a spectral change. And what we notice here are evidences by NMR of slow to intermediate exchange, which means that we have binding in the uh, low to submicromolar um, KD range consistent with the fluorescence data that I've already presented above. So um, here's one of some of the highlight peaks of here in particular. This looks like F48, which is in the cap binding pocket, has moved quite dramatically upon binding. Um, and as you can see, in some of these other cases, we just see loss of signal, which is a form of intermediate exchange, again indicating submicromolar to micromolar binding constants. And if we map the uh, chemical, the, the NMR changes that we observe onto the 4E structure, and some of these changes are just highlighted here, um, we can see several interesting features. And now let me just take you through this uh, diagram for a moment. It's rather complicated. But what you have here is anything that's colored green means that because of spectral overlap, I don't actually know if it's changed or not. Um, Anything that's cyan here on the dorsal surface is mainly cyan means that from our analysis we can tell there was no change in that region. And most importantly, what we can see here is substantial changes in the beta sheets and the cap binding site shown in, in blue, white, cy uh, blue, white, and yellow that indicate that, that the RTP is causing changes in the, NMR, changes in the structure of 4E um, in and around the cap binding site, consistent with our previous mutational data and, our, and the model that we've proposed. Of course, biophysics is lovely, um, but ultimately we would like to get, um, we'd like to be sure that ribavirin is actually binding for in cells in terms of, of understanding this as an inhibitor 
and moving forward. So what we've done in this particular immunoprecipitation experiment is a cross-link IP where we treat cells with tritiated ribavirin and um, either with immunoprecipitate with 4E or IgG and then assess what is the relative enrichment. And you can see here in these experiments we have about a 13-fold uh, enrichment of the association of ribavirin um, with, with endogenous 4E relative to IgG. And what you're seeing here are simply just the washes of the beads so you know that we're not having any uh, leftover radioactivity, but that this is a real enrichment. Now, okay, we have biochemistry and we can show it binds. Now, does it do anything? So here you can see that ribavirin impedes RNA export activity of 4E. We took an RNA export target um, here, cyclin D1, and you can see it's substantially reduced. And I should say that in, in, um, in a paper by Denis Rousseau uh, from the Sonnenberg lab in the 1996 or so in PNAS, had demonstrated that cyclin D1 was an export but not a translation target of 4E, and that's why we chose to monitor it here. What you can also see is that, um, that if we look at RNA export, and here we're look, looking at nuclear, uh, nuclear retention as a function of ribavirin addition, again fractionating cells and using real-time PCR to monitor the transcripts, that we, we have an, a substantial enrichment of second D1 transcripts in the nucleus as a function of ribavirin concentration. But VEGF, which is a translation but not an export target of 4E, is not changed at the export level, and total RNAs are unchanged. Furthermore, if we take an analog, which is actually in the fluorescence spectrum, a uh, fluorescence slide I showed you and forgot to mention, of rather uh, called group 4 c which um, for some structural reasons doesn't bind 4E, we can see it has no effect on, on um, cyclin D1 levels. So this is another um, evidence of, of specificity. What we see here is, an, is polysomal analysis. And so what we're looking at is the amount of any given transcript loaded onto the, um, onto the ribosome. So if we have, um, this is looking at real-time PCR cycles, and so the lower number correlates to having more RNA present. Now, first we can just look here at gap DH. Oh, and I, sorry, I should also say that these are polysomal fractions, and so you're more efficiently translated in the higher polysomal fractions than, say, in the ribosome or monosome fractions. So here is, um, and this work I should also say was done by, by Ivan Tupacirovich. And what you, can, what you can see here is that gap DH, for instance, has its uh, polysomes unchanged by the addition of ribavirin. And again, this is um, consistent with work that was published in the, in the Rousseau et al. 1996 PNAS paper that I mentioned earlier, where gap DH, um, the polysomal loading of gap DH was shown um, to not be changed by, by Fourier overexpression. So this is consistent. This is not a sensitive RNA. The black here is showing you just the overall polysomal profile, and so ribavirin is not having a gross effect on the polysomal profile. But what we can see for some transcripts that are translation sensitive, and remember ODC is one of these special ones that's translation and, um, and export sensitive, but here at translation, you can see that the addition of ribavirin causes a reduction in the amount of RNA that's in the polysome fraction relative to the amount that's in, in the lower efficiency translating fractions. And similarly, you can see this for VEGF in purple. Cyclin D1 was an RNA export but not a translation fraction, and what you can see Yvonne's data shows here is that um, we, don't have, we don't have a change in the polysomal distribution. These are just simply translations of this because um, before ribavirin we have much more cyclin D1 RNA in the cytoplasm than after ribavirin, but its polysomal loading is unchanged. And so this shows you that ribavirin has the same, uh, the sort of the same uh, converse effects of 4E that you would expect of a 4E inhibitor, and it inhibits both the export and translation functions, consistent with the model of being um, a, a competitor that we've already shown. Um, finally, this is an interesting piece of data from um, Philippa Peterson from Wilson Miller's lab that was, was, was published um, last year, where using a breast cancer cell line, she can actually show that if you do um, SI4, if, if you do SI4E plus ribavirin, you don't have any additional effects um, 
versus versus SI alone, strongly suggesting that both things are inhibiting the same pathway and again suggesting specificity in terms of ribavirin suppressing um, this this particular um, functionality of, of 4E and that 4E is a ribavirin target. If we go on and look at foci formation assays, um, you can see that ribavirin substantially suppresses cells transformed with 4E. Um, this is just simply the quantification of this. And our analog RIB4C that didn't change cyclin D1 also does not change the, the number of foci. Finally, if we look at, uh, an, well, next to finally, if we look at an animal model of, of cells that are known to be 4E dependent from previous studies from the Dia Bendetti lab, fatty cells with the head and neck squamous cell carcinoma cell line in a xenograft model. You can see um, quite, quite strikingly the, the mice that got, about, uh, got no ribavirin, they simply got PBS, versus the mice that got ribavirin, that there's a substantial difference in tumor load in these, in these xenografts, um, suggesting that in vivo this could work. Ribavirin, um, we then tested its ability to inhibit colony formation in primary human M4 and M5 AML cells. So here um, you're looking at the number of foci relative to untreated controls for either normal bone marrow and M5 AML or um, sorry an M5 AML or an, M, an M1 AML or an M5 AML. So what we can see is that, um, and I should say this is a log scale. So M1 AML does not have high 4E, and we see it's got about the same sensitivity as normal bone marrow, and quite a difference in terms of IC50 giving us sort of a therapeutic window to be able to specifically target those AMLs that have high 4E. Now, I'm only showing you three specimens here, but we've published extensively um, uh, so, you know, many, many colony growth assays using this sort of setup and, and probably analyzed again over 100 specimens. So you're seeing a representation of a big data pool. So AML, why have we focused on AML? Um, and poor prognosis AML is obviously um, the overall survival tends to be uh, at five years, less than 10 percent, and really it's a very aggressive disease, less acute, and we need, um, clearly need new therapies because the standard of care therapies have been the same since the 1970s and haven't really been working that well. So if we look at this paper by Alan Burnett, we can see that um, AML, for patients, particularly over 60, where the majority of patients will be diagnosed with AML, that the overall survival curves look pretty bleak. Um, as I said, average onset is in the late 60s. Um, many of these patients cannot actually survive, can't receive intensive chemotherapy. Um, patients that do not receive intensive chemotherapy have an overall uh, survival of about four months. And with intensive chemotherapy, there's a substantial 40 to 65 percent um, complete remission rate, which is great, but there's an 85 percent um, will relapse. Um, and patients clearly need consolidation or their CR duration will be very short, just two to four months. And as I said, overall survival at five years is less than 10 percent. So here's a bit more about AML. As I as I said, there's no new standard of care since the 1970s, and this is being based on ARC plus an anthracycline and is known in the field as 7 plus 3. Um, just to let you know, the current management of AML in older adults um, there's no, uh, is unsatisfactory. A standard of care is yet to emerge, and the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, which is the network that sends what cancer chemotherapy should be used in each kind of cancer, Guidelines recommend the clinical trials as the first option for nearly all patients with AML over the age of 60. This is taken from Carmina Abud's review. And um, unique problems with AML include, unlike other malignancies, that life expectancy of older patients with AML who opt for palliative care alone may be measured in days, not weeks or months. So I just want to give you a setting so you understand um, what's a good result and what's a bad result, because clearly, although we'd like to cure everyone, that, and that, as a first step, is probably too much to ask. So we used M4 and M5 AML patients because we knew that they had high 4E and we knew that their primary um, specimens were sensitive to ribavirin. So we carried out first a proof of principle 
phase two clinical trial using ribavirin monotherapy. No other therapies were permitted during this treatment. The patients that we have are typical of a clinical trial. They're either refractory in that they never responded to the therapy or they relapsed, i.e. they initially responded and then um, the cancer came back, and in M4 and 5 AML patients. Because uh, M AML and M4 and M5 subgroups in particular make this um, a small patient population, particularly in Canada, uh, we were a multi-center clinical trial, which um, was run out of the Jewish General Hospital um, with uh, Wilson Miller's clinical research unit and Suri Asselin being the key um, medical monitor and physician in charge of the trial. Uh, we also had patients from Hôpital Nathan of Rosemont here in Montreal, I should say Jewish General Hospitals and McGill Hospital here in Montreal, and out of Hamilton, Ontario, the McMaster Cancer Center with Brian Lieber. Um, and we also have a website if anyone is interested. Uh, for, for our total patients, um, we had 15 evaluable patients. That means patients that were on trial for at least 15 days. 12 of them showed some kind of clinical improvement. Um, we had a complete remission, which we had totally unanticipated. In fact, when we started the trial, the, um, uh, Dr. Asseline had suggested to me that that probably I should just prepare myself for stark failure and that no one will respond, and particularly in this very, very hard refractory and relapse setting. So to have a complete and two partial remissions was really way more than we hoped for. We also had three blast responses, and that's a 50% or more reduction in blasts, uh, which are the leukemia cancer cells. Um, so that those patients also had a response. We had six stable diseases, which means that the patients didn't get worse, and actually in AML that is considered a response, and three progressive diseases, i.e. these patients absolutely did not respond. Um, in, in one of these partial remission patients, we actually had a, a condition called a, a leukemia acutis, um, where these patients had uh, skin lesions, which is a sort of a metastatic, as you will, form of, of leukemia. And here we could see regression of skin lesions, indicating that we were able to target remote disease, which was also optimistic. The patients in the trial were all, um, we only had one patient with favorable cytogenetics. The rest uh, of the patients were intermediate to adverse risk for cytogenetics and, and had unfavorable molecular markers. So this was by no means a trial where we selected favorable patients to do well, really the, the inverse. We, we had the very sort of worst case scenarios. This is just to show you that in the patients we see similar results to, um, to what we see in cells. Now first of all, here's a bone marrow of a patient that was in complete remission before treatment and 28 days after oral ribavirin. And one of the nice things about our trial is that patients could take a, a bottle full of ribavirin pills at home and not have to stay in the hospital all the time. And you can also see that, for instance, if patients' platelets were recovering over time, so that they were seeing normal blood differentiation. Here is a confocal um, microscope micrograph of four E stain cells in green and blue is DAPI. And what we can see here is that 4E is very nuclear, very much like those cells I showed you at the very beginning of the presentation. And what you can probably see if you blow up your screen is that 4E is now moved mainly to the cytoplasm. This was a molecular response that we completely anticipated because previous studies in cell culture showed that ribavirin treatment moved 4A to the cytoplasm and is probably why it's inhibiting RNA export. And similar studies had been done by the Sonnenberg lab at Jose Doste that showed that 4A moved, um, that CAT treatments moved 4A to the cytoplasm as well. In terms of molecular response, we can see um, that our 4 targets, such as NBS1, and actually I didn't have time to show you, but 4 um, over overexpression leads to AKT activation, so ribavirin treatment actually leads to decreased AKT activation. So here, our molecular response is pretty much as we expected. We were quite surprised that in all cases, we also saw 4 RNA, or 4 protein and RNA levels go down, and so clearly this is a mixture of looking at ribavirin inhibition and reduction in 4E. We typically did not see 4A levels be reduced until around day 15. However, very early on, we can see 4A move. So somewhere between, I should say, 4A moves by day 15, RNA levels down by cycle 1 or day 28, indicating that, um, that the initial response is probably 4A moving out and then some sort of adaptive response in these cells or a specific selection of a subpopulation of cells now with lower 4E is occurring in the ribavirin-treated patients. 
Consistent with this impairment of ribavirin, we can see that the RNA export function, in particular for, this is a patient 10, for um, NBS1 RNA, but it's true for other patients and other RNAs, is substantially reduced um, by 28 days, and in this particular patient, that correlated with this patient achieving a complete, uh, a, sorry, a blast response. And I should say that of the patients that didn't respond, um, they had no molecular response, and we believe that they actually have impairment of uptake of ribavirin. This is another, uh, another patient who achieved a blast response here. You can see red are the, are the bone marrow, the percent of cells that are tumors or leukemic blasts in bone marrow, and in blue is from peripheral blood. And what we can see is when the patient's doing well, we see the 4E moving out, and actually we see this in many patients that as as the blast counts go up, we see re-entry of 4E, and we're very keen but don't yet understand completely what, what modulates the, the import and export of 4E from the nucleus, but clearly this is quite key to understanding what's going on. I should say that this, in this case and most of the cases that we monitored, we did not see 4E uh, levels themselves elevate upon resistance. So what next? Well, clearly, um, we want to understand the molecular underpinnings of resistance, but I don't have time to talk to you about that today. But um, we have uh, just a last slide or two to show you that um, that we can combine ribavirin with low-dose RSP, which is, although a chemotherapy, one that many elderly patients can tolerate well, um, and see if this can increase the frequency and duration of responses. So in this trial design, and this, the phase one portion of this trial is ongoing, we can see um, that we do have quite dramatic responses. Um, this is just the sort of scheduling of drug, but we see that response, rate, response of patients that achieve 20 micromolar or more ribavirin in this trial are quite dramatic. We've had two complete remissions, one that lasted for two years and one for nine months. We had a partial remission where the patient had to be taken off, not because of leukemia, but because of a dose-limiting um, toxicity. We had a, a blast response patient that was six months plus, and another blast response four months plus, and a stable disease, and then a patient that did not respond. Now, we did run into some PK issues I don't have time to talk about today, but what you can see is that um, the patients that achieved less than 20 micromolar ribavirin, and I should say there's no toxicity associated with this level of ribavirin at all, um, we, we, we didn't tend to have such nice dramatic results. And the only side effect we've only seen in a handful of patients, I should say, it, out of the sort of 40 patients we've treated for the two trials is, is um, hemolytic anemia, which is completely reversible um, and obviously much less toxic than your standard chemotherapies. This is just to show you that we have a similar pattern of molecular response. Um, this is the patient that responded for, for two years. Clearly, I'm only showing an early window of her response. These are the percent of bone marrow leukemia cells she has, so clearly nicely going down. Um, and what we can see is as they're going down, we're seeing 4E move out and stay out. And unfortunately, when she relapsed at two years, we saw 4E re-enter the cell as we'd seen previously. So just to, um, to wind up, I hope hopefully now that you think the EIF4E is, is a protein that's worth targeting and worth thinking about that 4E modulates the nuclear pore complex and promotes RNA export and transformation, and this is important uh, not only from cell but biological perspective of coming up with a new function for the nuclear pore and oncogenic transformation, but also showing you that this is relevant to, to patients who have dysregulated RNA export. Um, hopefully we've also shown you the, the targeting 4E in a phase 2 monotherapy trial with ribavirin shows remission, and we have some reasons for hope. Um, we still have some challenges to overcome in our combination setting, um, and we have many, many challenges, and, but some hope in the future for understanding what, why patients eventually become resistant, and this is unfortunately a topic I didn't have time to talk about today, but we do have a pretty good handle on that. And I'd just like to end by thanking the many people that were involved, um, particularly our clinical colleagues, Sri Asleen, Wilson Miller, Brian Lieber, Julie Bergeron, and Denis Claude Waugh, being central to the clinical trial efforts. Um, my collaborator Craig Jordan has been central for, for aiding us in a primary AML um, studies early on. Um, Vilya Chiklikovich, Krak, Glicic, and Orly Baguet um, did most of the nuclear pore complex um, 
data that I showed you, uh, Alex Pences and um, uh, Scott Ivan Tokasirovich were key in the early ribavirin experiments. Laurent Volpone and Mike Osborne have done, done the, the more recent um, NMR uh, ribavirin experiments. Um, I particularly like to thank the patients and their families for being willing to, to try our trial and um, for the funding agencies for uh, helping obviously for making all of this work possible and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, so I guess I will try to work out now how to go to the questions and answers and uh, question sections. Oh and I would also like to say that that there's a, that there's a chat room that I'll go to shortly after this this talk but I'll probably only stay about 10 minutes if if nobody comes. And if nobody has any questions now, I'll probably only stay here on the question and answer section for, for a minute or two. And so right now there, there, there doesn't seem to be um, any questions. Um, but let me see, make sure I get this. Oh, my question. Thank you, um, Darlene, for thanking me for the presentation. It's nice to know somebody is listening in this setting. It's very hard to know if there's any uh, impact. Um, and I don't know if there's anything else I can tell you of use. I just remind you to go to those website, um, the Bioconference Live website to get your CE credits um, if that was something that you were after today. And there's, uh, okay, so thanks Vince <laughs> for, for both inviting me for doing this talk and for your question. So Vincent's question is, any thoughts on the implications of your work on nuclear translation or NMD? And um, clearly, it's, it's a great question. We've, we've thought about it a lot. Um, so with, with our studies, since W73A uh, is a mutant that acts well in export and oncogenic transformation and changing the nuclear pore, as I showed you, but our studies and other studies have also shown it doesn't act in translation because it doesn't bind 4G very well because of the mutation on the dorsal surface. And so I'm guessing that it's, there could be nuclear translation, don't get me wrong, but I'm guessing what we're la looking at is probably not directly related to, um, to nuclear translation because of, of this mutation. Um, and maybe that is more CBC related in the nucleus, the other major cat binding protein. Um, so that's, that's all I, I can say for that. Um, uh, thanks, Naomi, for, for liking the presentation. Um, so I'm just trying to think if there was any other worthwhile thing to tell you um, while we wait to see if, if there's any other um, questions. OK. Um, okay, here's a question from Jonathan Monkmeyer. Um, Dr. Paulson and Dr. Prabhu from Penn State discovered that a derivative of fish oil has a very strong effect against leukemia. Have I collaborated with them? Uh, no, that sounds like a fascinating finding, but, but um, which I certainly need to go back and, and read about because I, I don't think I was aware of. So no, I, I haven't collaborated with them, but that sounds like a cool idea. So I guess I'll just stay maybe for another minute or so. And if anybody has any burning questions, we can go to the, to the chat room. So I think the chat room opens at 11. If it opens earlier, I'll obviously go earlier. Otherwise, I'll, I'll be there from like 11 to 11.10. Um, unless there's already lots of people there and lots of questions to ask. Um, so thanks very much for wherever you're listening from to, to be listening. And I guess that's, that's it for, for me. Thank you again. Oh.
Oh, sorry, there's one last question. Jonathan Monkmeyer asked, will it be available for viewing again later? And uh, yes, I've been told by the organizers, absolutely it will be. And if you have any questions and you can't make the chat room, I should have put my email on the screen, but please feel free to email me at katherine.borden at umontreal.ca. And, um, and you can tell me more about fish oil too, John, okay? Thanks.